This is case number 2009-0520, the matter of Roberta L. Scott and James P. Pierce. May it please the court, I'm Joshua Gordon. Um, I think this case is, is a lot simpler than it appears. There is a 2003 order, and that 2003 order sets the amount of child support and it sets the duration of child support. Um, and I think there's little argument that it sets the duration of child support. At the end of the USO, the, it's, it's, it says all paragraphs of this order, and it, and it says USO 96. It, it labels the, um, and in all paragraphs of the standing order, USO SO 96, are part of this order and apply to all parties. And you go to that exact numbered, um, that exact numbered form, and it says emancipation shall take place at age 18. I don't think there can be any legitimate argument that the that the the 2003 order didn't uh, didn't didn't change the emancipation age to 18. So, so that so the appellant, having failed to notice that, waived or missed her opportunity to challenge the duration. Her that's right. Her opportunity was back in 2003. She argues it's contradicted by the narrative. Well, it's not really contradicted by the narrative. There's several um, instances in the uh, findings of fact and one in the narrative that say, that, that, that report what the 1997 and the earlier 1989 agreement said. That they said such and so, but uh, it's in recognition of what they said. And the reason uh, the, it, it recognized that was that um, there had been a deal struck in the 19. 97, I think, our uh, agreement that child support would be less for the term of emancipation being longer. And when, in 2003, that deal was undone. And that was the recognition um, that, that was in the narrative. But the narrative nowhere can contradicts the, uh, the standing order. And it, it's certainly not in any direct contradiction. It's merely a recognition of what was in the earlier agreement. Help me out on this. I thought the agreement that was signed initially said that payment would be made if the kids were in college through age 21, then amended to age 23. And so what happened to that? What, what's the, what happened to those agreements? Uh, Ms. Scott went to court in 2003, right. and that, there, there was no mandatory age 23. Massachusetts laws is, is permissive. And the uh, no, but there was, was. I thought maybe I misunderstood. I thought there was an agreed to amendment that raised the age to 23 if the kids were in college. If the kids were in college, then then emancipation would be to 23, and they would discuss the costs of it and so forth. But okay. he did, in fact, pay the support through all that time period, didn't he? He paid. And the, the argument the trial court was saying, well. Maybe technically this isn't exactly correct, but he paid all this money for a lot longer than he would have had to in New Hampshire, and that adds up to the college payments. Right, and, 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 and he paid that because he didn't, you know, Massachusetts was taking it out, and I think he eventually got sick of it and did something about it in New Hampshire, but he paid something like $30,000 overage. Um, and the uh, amount... Because why? Because under the Massachusetts decree, he was obligated to because he just never did anything about it. It just kept on going, and Massachusetts kept on taking money out of his, out of his bank account. Eventually, in 2008, he, he filed something to try what, to do something about Were they about taking that. money out of his bank account in violation of the stipulation? In violation of the 2003 order. Of the Superior Court? Uh, no, uh, yes, excuse me, of the Superior Court. I thought the Superior Court in 2003 ordered payment of arrearages to the college fund. Yes, I can see that there is a $9,300, I think, um, arrearage due, you know, and, and that's, and that's the, the, the swap that the trial court did here in 2009 was, was uh, Ms. Scott claimed neither nine or $12,000 for, for one child and a, a $9,000 uh, college expenses and a $9,000 arrearage. That adds up to something in the range of $20,000. My client overpaid by 30 and he just... The court just said, let, let Maybe go. my memory is fuzzy here, but I thought what the trial court did was to modify child support going back four years. That's in effect what the, what the, trial, the trial court did, but I don't think there's any, um, 
there's any violation of the statute in doing so. Well, how can RSA 458 C73 says you have to take into account, you have to bring all accounts up to date when you terminate. So, so no, but how, how does the trial court, I, I, maybe my understanding of the law is incorrect. I, I thought if you were seeking to modify child support, it could be modified no sooner than the date the other party received notice of your request. It could not go behind that. And here the trial court seems to me went behind it. Yes, but, but Ms. Scott got a notice that, that, uh, of an automatic termination of child support in the 2003 order. And that is, that is the, the USO is just uh, very unambiguous. Evidently and, your client pardon wasn't me? able to, det to detect that though. Well, he, he was uh, under the, the Massachusetts tax authorities were taking money out of, of, of his account and, you know, he kept on thinking it would disappear and it didn't disappear. He finally did something about it. But, um, and, and, and so there, there's no question there's that wrinkle, but, but, but so what? You know, at the end of the day, there is $30,000 going one way and $20,000 going the other way and the judge says, you know, make it all go away, and it seems fair. I thought, again, I thought the trial court said, when it came to college expenses, I, the New Hampshire judge, under New Hampshire law, which I'm applying, does not allow me to enforce this, had no jurisdiction. That's not true. Oh, I think it is true. On the, on the, the, the older child, you know, we can see that there's an, an arrearage. On the younger child, there's no pre- uh, pre-statute, I'm talking about the, 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 the Donovan statute, there's no pre-statute stipulation that says, I will pay. It says, I will talk about paying. So this is not the Donovan or the Cole case. This is, um, I think, uh, the, the name of the case is, is, is Grossman well, it's, and it's, Elliott it's, or something it's, like that. Is, is more didn't it say more than I will talk about it? I thought the stipulation wasn't that illusory. I thought it was, we'll talk about it to determine the reasonable sum. Yes, but there's no sum. There's no sum. They, they either didn't be, talk about it or they agreed on it. Would there be zero. a concomitant good faith obligation to come up with some sum if there were an ability to pay? Well, whether there is or not, I, you know, I, I don't know. Why doesn't they, that make it pre-Goulart, uh, pre-statutory change? Because there's no, there's no stipulation that says, I will pay. Then Donovan and Cole, they were, there was an obligation to pay a certain amount. There's no obligation to pay. It was just an obligation to talk about it. So there's no, there's no jurisdiction now to start ordering college payments for when there was no pre-Donovan pre stipulation. Especially where both kids are out of college, right? Well, yes, especially now when both kids are out of college. But even if they weren't, we're still after the statute. And, and there's no, there's no pre-existing stipulation saying, I will pay, you know, X Is, dollars. Isn't there an obligation under 46B49 the college expenses were part of child support, right? That's how they were. Well, they were part of the divorce. No, I know that, but they, they were part of child support. That's how I interpret them. Is that not accurate? That's not fair? I always see college expenses as one thing, child support something else, but no matter. All right. Under 49, New Hampshire may not modify any aspects of a child support order that may not be modified under the law of the issuing state. Um, don't they have to do more than under Goulard, we can't do it? Don't they have to say, could this be modified under law in Massachusetts? Don't they have to apply Massachusetts law? Well, Massachusetts law does not require college expenses be paid by another parent. It, it allows them to, different from New Hampshire, but it doesn't no. require, so they could modify to not, to okay. under Massachusetts law. My, my point was, the trial court didn't do that gymnastic. Trial court said, I'm looking at New Hampshire law, and New Hampshire law deprives you of jurisdiction, end of case. That's not the analysis. Well, you know, it might, be, it might be the analysis. It, I don't really think it matters. Either, either if, if you apply Massachusetts law, you get the same outcome. If you apply Goulart, you get the same outcome. But um, I, I don't think the trial court was necessarily wrong because, um, uh, because, because there's no pre-existing there's no pre-existing stipulation, and therefore, Goulart can apply. Or, the, or it, it's, it's really technically, I think, I think Cole or, or, or Donovan, but it's no jurisdiction. So I, I think it comes out the same no matter what. But the analysis was wrong, is my point. I don't know. In 2003, there was the, the, the New Hampshire court took jurisdiction. Rightly or wrongly, it did it. 
and nobody objected to it. I'm not sure it, file, it followed the UIFSA or, or didn't. Uh, it just assumed well, jurisdiction. Well, that's because to, somebody f registered the decree here, right? Someone registered Because the, nobody's in Massachusetts anymore. Because no one's in Massachusetts, and the 2003 court assumed New, New Hampshire jurisdiction, and no one complained. So now it looks like New Hampshire's the issuing court. Well, let me ask you this, because my, my, my memory of the facts here are not probably as crisp as yours. I thought in 2003 the trial court ordered the husband, your client, to pay $3,000 a year towards one of the children's college. Right. Is that true? Correct. You didn't appeal it? Correct. Did the court rescind that in some way later on? No, my client owes that. But that's the, that's the, that's the, the older child and where there was, a, there was an order in, in effect. It's not affected by Goulart. It's the younger child where there's no pre-existing obligation So he to does pay. not, That's he doesn't dispute that he owes that $3,000 a year toward the older child? No, he doesn't dispute that. Did that so-called arrearage go into the New Hampshire court's calculation when it did this offsetting, yes. balancing yes. thing? Yes, it, it did. did. Yes, yes the, the total arrearage uh, or the total swap, I guess, that the, that the trial court did here in, in 2009 was $30,000 of arrears on child support payments, not, not college, on the one side, you know, that he overpaid. And the part that he didn't pay was nine or $12,000, made up exactly what you're saying, and, uh, and the $40 payment and, and perhaps some other things that add up to about $20,000. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Case submitted. Counsel, in the last case of the